Good morning. All right. Welcome to the first session of the last day of Braille Forum. It's early morning, right? So, here we go. So today's session title is Customize All the Things. How to brand Windows and Web UI. So I'm going to will be two parts today. I'm going to teach you how to do stuff with web, which this is not a, a you know a specific thing about any kind of one type you know one technology like RD um, web or Citrix web interface or um, any VMware things. It's just general web stuff that you can do in your environment. And uh, Windows, I'll show you a, a few things that you can do with Windows applications. But you know, I, I submitted this session proposal, and I'm American, so I, I, I customize. You know, I spell customize, and I look up on the session title on the agenda, and I realize, no, they corrected it for me. We're in London, right? So customize all the things. And you know, all the things, all the things. <laughs> so you might see a few more rage faces as we go in here. So a bit about me first. My name is Jason Conger. Um, I, my, my current employer is, is Splunk. I, I, I do uh, uh, product management for desktop virtualization at Splunk. That's the last time I'm going to mention that name. Um, I'm also a, a sector technology professional and a uh, Microsoft MVP for remote desktop services, so I do a lot of desktop virtualization stuff. Um, but this is you know, a lot of front-end stuff around that. And then um, I, I have a blog about some of these things, and you can catch me on Twitter if you, uh, if you do that Twitter thing. All right, so without further ado, let's do Windows stuff first. So believe it or not, there are some things you can do to customize Windows applications because desktop virtualization, as Brian mentioned in the keynote, the majority of our applications are run on Windows. So what can we do with Windows applications? Um, a little bit of a history lesson on in where this session came from is a long time ago, um, a buddy of mine asked me, you know, we have this, uh, this log on thing. So when somebody connects to our, it used to be called MetaFrame, well, even before then, it was like OneFrame and all, you know, OneView and all these things. But MetaFrame, at the time when this guy asked me, he's like, you know, they're connecting, can I change that? Can I change that logo? You know, this is a, a Windows thing. This is not a trivial thing. It's like, yeah, probably. So went through and started digging around and it turns out it's not that hard to do. You just go have to hack a couple of DLLs to do it, and that sounds harder than it is. You know, say hacking DLLs. Ooh, no, that, it's actually not that not, not hard. So, you know, everybody's good. Yeah, they're happy, right? No, the EULA came along and said, nope, can't do that. So, end user license agreement. So, I had to go update this article, and I say, well, this is just for uh, education purposes. Then, so the article's still up there on how to do it. It still applies today, but now it's like, you may be violating your EULA if you do this. So don't violate your EULA, but for the sake of education, we'll leave this up here, right? So today's lesson is an educational lesson. Don't break your EULA. Some general notes about EULA is, you know, here's three bullet points that whether you think you're breaking your EULA or not. So the first thing is, if you, uh, you know, if you modify copyrighted software that you own a valid license for, that you, own, that you just use for yourself, you're probably OK. Um, if you go modify copyrighted software and sell it, that's obvious violation. Don't do that. Don't redistribute software that you modify. I mean, if you're just, like I said, tweaking it for learning purposes for yourself, you're okay. Don't redistribute, don't sell it. That's an obvious violation. Now, this one is where most of us sit. Um, it's in that kind of a gray area. If you, if you go modifying copyrighted software that your organization owns a valid license for and you're not going to distribute outside your organization, maybe you're okay. Um, if you have a legal department, check with them. But, like I said, this session is just for educational purposes. So, um, I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid, I liked to take apart my toys to see how they worked. Most, uh, most of you know, guys that tinker in this type of thing, going and 
seeing how things work. You know, they, when they were a kid, that's kind of rooted in it. And uh, I remember, you know, it, these things that had like the little Phillips head screwdriver and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And my dad caught me taking these, uh, these toys apart and I'd put them back together. Most of the time they still work when I put them back together. And so one day he changed out all the screws on it and from a Phillips head screwdriver to a torque head screwdriver. I don't know if you guys know what that is. But the screw, is, so I couldn't go and take it apart anymore. Well, I knew where he kept his torque head screwdriver set, so I just went and got his screwdrivers and continued to take my toys apart. But you learn a lot about how things work when you take things apart. Hopefully you can get them back together, but not always. So what we're going to do is we're going to take things apart. So you see how it works. So when I start talking about hacking DLLs or XEs and things like that, it sounds harder than it is. It's really not that hard. So the first thing we're going to do is you, we're going to use a tool called Resource Hacker, which is an open source available tool um, to modify some Windows applications to change a couple of things. So first of all, we're right into demos. Before we get doing that, I want to show you, I'm not violating, violating EULA on this because we're going to customize um, a program that I wrote. So I am the author. I give us permission to disassemble this thing. But just to show you what happens, you know, when, when somebody's writing a program, a Windows program, and this is Visual Studio, we're not, this is not a coding session, so we're not doing to actually do any coding. But the reason I opened this up is this is the program we're going to modify today. And it's a, a really stupid program just for, you know, for uh, learning purposes. But what happens is when somebody wants to go add menu items and dialog boxes and all that, it's called a resource. And so we have this tab right here. It says resource view. So we're viewing all the resources that are in this project. And some of the things that you'll see in the project is when I want to display a, uh, a picture, there's a bitmap there. So that's what the, that particular resource looks like. Um, when I want to put the dialog boxes, here's the, the, uh, the dialog boxes that we have. Uh, let me get some more screen real estate here. So here's a dialog box, and you'll see this pop up later. Um, and then we have uh, menus, things like that. So we have a, a menu over here that goes to our program. And so there's, you know, when we're creating a, a system menu up here, this is how you do it. So all of these things are resources for a program. So that's why the program we're about to use to get around all this stuff is called Resource Hacker. So it's very easy to modify a Windows application if you have the source code, right? So for argument of this session, normally you do not have the source code. So how do we get around, you know, doing this? Like I mentioned, we got Resource Hacker. So here's Here's the stupid program that we that we wrote, and this is what you know. This is what you just saw. So this is a dialog box, and it has that that little menu thing. And I put you know the kind of the idea. Some re reasons you'd want to do this is some real world reasons I've used is like there's a menu item that just is stupid. No user should ever click that, and we don't want them to ever click it. So the best thing to do is take it away. You know, or there might be a, a button that says stupid. You know, and it, it's it, I've seen this like in programs. It's like there's an option that is the most stupid thing that you would never want an end user to do, and you can't lock them down. There's no like um, granular security access on this, and it might be an administrative thing that I never ever want my end user to see this, so we need to take it away or disable it or something like that. Of course, we don't have the source code, so it's a little bit harder to do. So here's how you do it. So again, Go download, get, download Resource Hacker, which the link is on the, the slide there that you can get. But we'll just open up this program using Resource Hacker. Anybody use Resource Hacker before? Okay, good. So this is relatively new information. All right, so here's what Resource Hacker looks like. It looks eerily similar to that resource view I just showed you in Visual Studio, right? You have over here uh, a tree view of different resources that belong to this project. And like you just saw a minute ago, there was a image that was our header image. We have some menu items that are in our program. So there's the menu items. And it actually, you know, this is what it looks like in, in text. You can see up here, but also they will start drawing the menu for you um, in Resource Hacker so you can do that. You can add menu items. You can take menu items away. Now, if you add menu items um, you, and you want the, your program to do something new, 
you know, the, the original developer didn't put in a procedure to do some brand new functionality in his program. Believe it or not, you can add to an executable as well. So you can add a menu item and make it do something without the source code. Um, it's a little bit more involved and you have to understand a little bit of assembly language to do it, just a little bit, but it can be done. Um, I don't have an example for this, but I do plan, I'm doing this session again in Chicago, and I do plan on updating that session in Chicago to show you how to do that as well. And as attendees of Briveform here, you get access to all Briveform content. So if you want to see how, it, how it's done, um, it'll be in the Chicago video by the time we get over there, okay? And so, you know, here's the menu items. And then, like I said, dialogues. We had the, the dialogue that we created earlier. And here's where we're going to do some of our work. All right. So here's our dialogue. And this is Resource Hacker. This is not Visual Studio. We're not looking at source code. And so, so the first thing we want to do is get rid of that button. Because we never, ever want an end user to click that button because it's a stupid button. So what we do is very easy. Come over here. Select the button. Let me move it up here so it's a little bit. Select the button. Right click. Delete it. It's gone. Now we just click this button for compile script. That compiles the script. Save it. Close resource hacker. Launch our executable and the button is no more. The button's gone. So we modified a Windows program without the source code. You can also replace resources. You can get rid of resources. You can replace resources as well. So if I go open this thing with Resource Hacker again, this is how I did the in the slide deck at the beginning. This is how I um, changed the image on that uh, logon dialog. You just come over here to the image, and you say, instead of that image, I just want to, you can right click and say, replace this resource. And you have this dialog to say, all right, what do you want to replace it with? So I go down here and I say, I want to replace it with my new header troll image. So do that, save, close, launch our executable again, resource has been replaced. So I have modified this. Now, of course, you know, there, there are use cases for changing out images. You can put company logos on there, whatever you want to do. Um, <clears throat> but most of the time, what I've used Resource Hacker for in the real world is either getting rid of buttons or menu options because they're confusing the end user. You want to simplify things. You don't want, you, you don't want too many choices because too many choices just leads to being overwhelmed, and especially if some of the choices are stupid, right? So you don't want that. So that, in a nutshell, is Resource Hacker. Questions about Resource Hacker before we move on? Okay, very good. Yes, sir. How would you cope with the upgrading of an application? So if you, what's that? So the, the question is, how do you deal with the uh, application that's getting upgraded, part one, and then part two, um, auto um, options, automatic trying to think of, uh, I guess, automation options. Yeah, that, I was looking for the word. Automation options with Resource Hacker. Right. So you can do automation with Resource Hacker, A. Uh, of course, obviously, if somebody goes and replaces that executable, then your customizations are gone. So if I'm a, a developer and I go over here, I rebuild this, so I'm recompiling this executable and I'm creating a new executable, of course, that's going to overwrite what I already did. So, you know, over here, wait, wait rebuild, okay, rebuild succeeded. So if I go and launch this again, my customizations are indeed wiped out because I've rebuilt that. The resources are replaced by my new build versus what I've done with Resource Hacker. Um, however, the uh, executable, most of the executables that I've customized in the real world are not updated very often. And then when they are, the resources are really never updated. So they might um, change, you know, might add new functionality, but it's very trivial to go through and do these, uh, these customizations again. So that's your options. Okay? All right. 
So moving right along, that's how you can go through and do customization of a Windows application, even if you don't have the source. Now, there's one caveat. Oh, yeah, the other example. So just to show you, you know, that was a program that I wrote, so naturally that worked, right? I wrote it for a demo, naturally the demo worked. I wanted to show you that it's not magic, and I wasn't trying to hide anything, so I got permission from another developer. It was my co-presenter yesterday, Warren Simonson, from Control-Alt-Delete. He's written several tools that are free to the community, and so this is not my code, but I just wanted to show you, yes, indeed, it does work on real world code. So back in demo again, it's, it's going to be basically the same exercise going through and using Resource Hacker. Let me maximize this. So his code over here is called TS Snaps Nin. And what this, the idea behind this particular um, utility is, is it's a, uh, a background program and a user has a problem in their environment, um, either on a terminal server or on their Windows desktop or whatever, and the idea is they can press a hotkey combination and it will take a screenshot of their environment, add a couple of more variables to it, and then send it off to the uh, an email address of the help desk. So the hotkey combination by default is Control-Alt-D, so that brings up the little dialog here, and it says, all right, here, you know, you have to do a configuration where, you know, where's your SMTP server, and you know what you can type in where to send it to, and it says where it's sending it from. But basically, you, you click this button, says send screenshot to email. And so it takes a screenshot, sends it to email, no problem. So my idea, I've actually have people that have used this, and it's very very nice. But what I wanted to do is, you know, he has all this this dialogue here, but I wanted to add some some verbiage down here that says, oh, and by the way, here's some helpful phone numbers. So here's like the help desk phone number. So we'll cancel this and quit. I'll quit TSS, snaps in. And it's very easy, again, on Resource Hacker. You just go find the dialog. Sometimes there's multiple dialogs. And you might have to look through a couple. So that happens to be the one that we want, right? That's the one that we saw. And so, again, just like adding a button, you know, buttons and all this, you can resize the dialog. So let's get some real estate down here for our new um, information. Just right click, insert control, and here's the different controls. It's very similar to like a Visual Studio or an IDE. I want to put in a label, and what I want my label to say, also a help desk. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's the, the help desk phone number for our organization. You can see that it's not quite sized right. It kind of got all you know jumbled up so we can right click and edit the control and say the width is maybe 155 to give our control enough room so there it says help desk one two three four five six click this thing that says compile script and hopefully that didn't just break I might have broke it it worked earlier It is a possibility that I still have it running as a process. Bear with me one second. No, I do not. Oh, it's back, something's back here behind the dialogue. Ha, <laughs> resource hacker had a error. Let's see if I can do it again. My apologies. Okay, again, let's add our control and some space down here. And it's a label. It's going to say help desk. And again, the width is not going to be right, so we'll go ahead and do the width. So there we have help desk. Hopefully it works this time. Compile. All right, well, that one didn't work for some reason. Let me force close this.
Do you want to take my word for it or do you want me to try it one more time? <laughs> he says it works. I promise it works. So we won't waste a lot of time on that. I promise it works. Um, and and uh, that, that's the first time it's actually failed. I've done that several times to make sure it would work for you guys. But demo gods are not smiling on me. Okay. So I promise that works. You can go and you know, add your, your dialogue there. So that's a real world example using you know, somebody else's code. Now, there comes a problem. Those two programs were written in C++. If you have something that is written in like a C chart or VB.net or something like that that relies on the .NET framework, Resource Hacker sometimes will not help you because those programs store their resources differently. So a quick lesson on how .NET programs work. When you write your code, you're doing all your coding in Visual Studio and you're, you're in C Sharp or VB.net or something like that, you're coding and when you compile, you're not actually compiling to machine language. You're compiling to something called MSIL, which is Microsoft Intermediate Language. Then you have your .NET framework here that interprets the intermediate language and turns it into machine language and allows you to run it on your Windows environment. Which is, this is very similar to the same thing with Java and having a Java uh, JVM or JRE or something like that. Same concept. So that's how people can program in multiple language. You get to choose which language you want, but still compile it for the .NET framework. So, funny enough that the .NET framework comes with two uh, utilities. It's called ILDASM and ILASM. Want to take a guess what those things stand for? Those are both executables. This one stands for Intermediate Language Disassemble. This one stands for Intermediate Language Assemble. Let's look at another program real quick on a application. So what we're about to do is disassemble. Remember, this is for learning purposes. Your EULA says specifically don't disassemble. We're going to change stuff, reassemble it, and there we go. Again, this is one that I wrote, so we have permission to do this. Back over here, we have this other customization example that is written in C Sharp. So this particular example is, is basically you know, very similar to the first thing that we did. So we have then debug, customize CS. This is a C Sharp application, so very similar to what we were doing earlier. You know, there's, a, there, there's an image. But if I go try to open this thing in Resource Hacker, if I edit this with Resource Hacker right here, I don't have very many resources. I have a version and there's some information in this 24 thing, which is just an XML file. I don't see the resources. I don't see that image in there. So how do I get around this? You might think, oh, well, I can't do it, which is wrong. Because what we can do is come over here. Let me actually clear out a folder here. I was doing this earlier. Oh, good, it is empty. All right, so what we can do is we'll start up a command prompt, and I will, I'll maximize this in a minute so you can see it better. Let me get my directory to the right place. So basically, I'm just changing the directory to that test um, folder that I had open earlier, just, you know, that's where I'm going to sh store my disassemble stuff. So there's this test folder, that's where I want to disassemble and I want to put all my stuff there, so I just changed the directory there to make it easy. So here's, here's what we do. I'll say intermediate language disassemble, that's um, the, the command, and then you have to give it a, uh, a path to the thing that you want to disassemble. So I just happen to know it's in C, um, users, Administrator, um, documents, customize, uh, uh, Visual Studio. No, oh, wrong administrator. Documents, Visual Studio, projects. So what this is, um, you know, intermediate language disassemble, and I'm just giving it a path 
to the thing I want to, to disassemble right there. So that's the command. Oh, there's, I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm glad I maximized that because that's not the correct path. That was a different one. Customize an example CS for the C sharp one. I don't know what just happened. Uh, I got in some kind of tool that is doing a zoom. Do you guys know what this is? How do I get rid of that? Oh, there, there it is. Okay. <laughs> that totally messed me up. All right, so I got to type all that junk again. Sorry, guys. Um, actually, here, I got it right here, just in case something weird like that happened. Um, so I won't type all that again because I have it there. All right. Yeah, I see. I did, didn't I? Thanks. This is fun, isn't it? All right, there we go. So I won't try to do that Zoom thing again because I don't know what happened there. That was weird. So what you know, intermediate language disassemble the path to the exa uh, the executable, and then just this um, parameter out, and it says test.il. That's just what I want it to be called: the intermediate language test.il. So press enter there. It does its um, disassembly thing, and lo and behold, over here in our test folder, here is the disassembled C sharp code. And now you'll see a couple of things that says resources up here. That's where the resources are kept. They're compiled resources, they're part of the executable. Now, Resource Hacker won't modify those files, so we have to use something else. This is a different tool called Resourcer. So we'll come over and open this guy here, and then we can use Resourcer to open up that. Uh, that thing, so we'll go to our desktop folder, test, and this thing right here, and there we have our header image that we saw from earlier. So we can use resourcer to go replace the thing in the resource file. So I want to import a new file, that one that we, you know, the, the troll guy again. We'll import him. So here's our header troll, and we'll get rid of the original one, so just click that delete it. Now it has to be named the same thing. So it can't be head called header troll BMP, so it just has to be called header. Header. Save that. That saves the resource file. Close it. So now we have modified that resource file, but this is still disassemble code, so we have to reassemble everything. So we just this is quite a bit easier actually. So we go back in here we disassembled everything, and now we use ILASM for intermediate language assemble, and then we just need to give it a test, or I mean the path to our intermediate language. Press that, and it creates it in that, um, that existing folder. So in our test folder here, we have this text test.exe. That's a new executable, but as you can see, we modified, it reassembles everything back together like it should be with our modified resource. So that's how you go and modify a .NET program. Questions? All right. That's kind of a lot of stuff for 8.30 in the morning. All right. So that's the demo on what you do. Is it? The resourcer is not. It's right. It's on the slide here. That's where you can download it. So you just click that. You can go download the resourcer. All right. And then the command, I just saw it, you saw it was in the notes on the slide as well. I just did a copy and paste so you can see how to do that. All right, again, that's it on, you know, it, there's some things you can do on Windows. There's not a whole lot, but that was all for educational purposes. I had permission from the authors, me and a friend of mine, to do that to show you don't do evil things. Educational. All right, let's talk about web. So, this is probably a, a a more common use case for modifications, right? So 
you have some kind of web app that's delivered to your environment and you, you know, the first thing people want is, like, oh, I want colors changed and I want logos and all that. So in order for you to do that, you have to know a little bit about CSS, so cascading style sheets. This is not a heavy web developer um, session. A couple of things are still a little bit heavy for 8.30 in the morning, but um, we're just going to go over some basic things that you need to know about modifying. So not, I'm not going to teach you how to do CSS and grids and all this. We're just going to talk about modifying that something that's already there. Okay. So the first thing you need to know when modifying things is style sheet precedence. Whenever you look at the source of an HTML file, you'll see the things. You'll have a, a header and a title and then maybe some JavaScript things. And then you might see one or more style sheets. Whatever the last guy is wins. So if, the, you know, if style sheet one says do this, and then style sheet two says do this, you know, here's an element, make it look like this, and style sheet two, two says no, do it this way, and style sheet three says no, do it this way, that guy is going to win most of the time. There are some caveats to that, but style sheet three is going to win. So whatever's at the bottom wins. And that's important for our example in a minute because what I normally do is I don't go modifying the original style sheets. I create my own and make sure I put it way down at the bottom so whatever I say wins. The next thing you need to know is um, specificity uh, calculations. So <clears throat> this is an excerpt from a style sheet up here. This is what a style sheet looks like. And then this is some HTML. And so you see you have this paragraph class equal bio. And then you have this you know, one style sheet rule that says for paragraphs use 12px for the text size. The other one says p.bio use 14px. So what size is that going to show up? Which one do you think? 12 or 14? Which one? 14, 14 yes. Because the reason is this is more sp specific than that. The more specific you get, is what's going to win if you have multiple things that apply. And this is important when you're trying to make your own style sheet. Not only is it at, I mean, at the bottom, but if somebody above you is more specific than what you decide, then you may not win on what you want it. And you may get, you know, you're thinking that, oh, I'm going to modify this, I'm going to do this thing. Why is it not showing up? Bang your head against the wall. It's because they were more specific earlier. All right, another example that's not so easy to understand. Same kind of thing where, you know, I'm saying p.bio is 14 pixels, and then sidebar p should be 12 pixels. So here's a uh, div, id equals sidebar, class equals bio, what size text? What do you think, which one's going to win now? What size do you think bio text will be? Will it be 14 or 12? Hmm? Hmm? You know? It will be 12. Why? It seems like div p bio would be more specific, but actually the second one is more specific, and I'll show you why. I mean, and just to, to prove that you know I'm not lying, I do have the, the sheets up here, that actual HTML. This example one, well we already did that, you saw that it was going to be 12 pixels, so if I actually open it up you'll see um, example one. There's biotechs. Then if I open up the other one, over here on example two, it's smaller. And if we look at this, this is on the example two, to show you that, you know, that's hard to see. But that is the, the, you know, the style sheet and the whole HTML to show you which one wins. Now, the reason being is math. You have to do math, I know. Here's what happens on a style sheet rule. So when you are looking, I know this is exactly what you wanted to do this morning. When you're looking at elements in your, in your environment, you have to go through and figure out what's specific. So here's the rules for specificity. This is how you calculate it. So when you see an inline style, you, well, you, first of all, you do an A, B, C, D. So A, B, C, D. So you write these things out. So if you see an inline style, this is an example of an inline style. If you have an element that says style equals this, you put a one way over here. If it has multiple of those, well, it'll only have, ever have a one. So you put a one there. 
Then if something has an ID, which a P ID, you put a one in that spot. Then you have a class and pseudo class and attributes and all that, which would be class or alt or um, text or whatever. If you have a class equals that, then you put a one in that position. And then finally, if you have what's called an element, which is just anything that's in HTML is just an element, standard element, you put a one over here. And then you add them all up together, and whatever, you know, if you have something, a one here and a zero here, the one wins. Or if you have a, a zero here and a 12 here, still the one over here wins. So whatever it has the biggest number to the left wins. So if you look at what we were looking at earlier, if you look at um, the rules, we have a, on this particular one, you look, are there, no, neither one of them have an inline style. So neither one of them have left um, one over here, all right? Then you look at things that have an ID. This thing has an ID, right, for sidebar, so it has a one right there. That one, this other one doesn't have any IDs. Then you look for classes. This one has a class, bio. So you put a one there. This guy up here has no classes. And then finally, you look at elements, basic HTML elements, which div is an element and p is an element. So both of them have two. So that one wins, the 12px wins, because it's more specific. That's a lot of information that the reason I, I do all this is because I've, when doing um, style sheets and trying to modify stuff, it can be frustrating at times thinking what, what you expected is not what you get. And that's one of the main reasons why. Okay, questions on this? We're not going to do any more. Ah, yes. So is there an easy way? Right. So is there? Right. So, so the question is: there an easy way to see the math? Like, if you have a really big style sheet, is there an easy way for it just to calculate for you? I don't know of a way that will show you that. The reason I mentioned this is what I'm about to show you in a minute is if you want to modify something, and I want to override what's there, is a lot of times I'll say, "All right, I'll go through this, this exercise here to see." And it can just go in that one piece because we're just looking at that one thing. It's like, all right, I want to get more specific, so I might go make sure I have a one in that position or a one in that position to make sure that I override what's more specific. I don't know of something that's out there. Um, that's a good question, though. I'll have to go see if there is something out there. I'll show you the number. But what we're about to see is um, there are various tools that will help you figure out and target which specific element that you want to go modify. Good question. Other question? Okay. So the next thing I'll talk about is layers. Every element in HTML is actually 3D. It has a width, a height, and a depth. Now most of the time, I mean, you don't see a depth, but you do everything stacks on top of each other. So you can think of it, you know, stacking layers on layers on layers. And a lot of times they overlap. And you have to make sure what you want to see is at a higher layer than um, something else. So a lot of times you'll have something and you'll like, create all this, you know, this cool picture and you don't see it. And it's because it's stuck behind a layer that's on top of it. So you don't see it. So what we can do is this is where we start getting into some of the tools. My favorite tool for modifying web pages is by far Firefox. And just for, for sake of argument, um, we're going to modify what everybody likes to modify, Citrix Web Interface. This has a few, like, and the reason I chose this is because everybody wants to modify it, but it doesn't have a whole lot of layers to get us you know, crazy, um, you know, crazy confused. So a lot of times you know, people will go in and you start hacking the code, but a lot of your stuff can be done with style sheets. So, what I do is the first thing in Firefox is I right click and you say inspect element. And what that's going to do, and this is a little bit hard to see, but don't worry about it right now, is it highlights that element and it shows you where it is in the HTML. Here's all the HTML, it'll, it'll pinpoint where it is, but then it'll show you over here all the style sheet that is appropriate. So you can see there's a hashtag horizon top image, so you, you know that it gives you these 
um, specificity right there on that thing, it doesn't show you the, you know, those numbers, the math thing, but it shows you what you're targeting. But here's the cool thing. This is the reason I like Firefox is even now you may not, you don't see layers, right? I don't see the layers behind what's stacked on top of each other. Firefox is the only browser that I know that does this. So if I'm up, you know, if you go down a little bit here, there's this little button in the bottom right called 3D view. Like I said, all elements in HTML are 3D. If you have a graphics card that supports what's called WebGL, which a lot of graphics cards do, you can do this. You click that, and you now have a 3D view of your web page. So you can see the layers that's what's going on. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. I can flip it all the way around, see the back. So now I'm looking at the various layers of what's going on, and I can click the layers, and it, again, down here at the bottom, it shows me where they are in HTML, so I can go modify these layers and do my own style sheets. But not only that, you can modify the style sheet over here to make sure you're doing it right before you commit it and go write your own style sheet. So uh, this is an enormously helpful tool. So if I want to target that thing right there, I know there's that layer. It's, um, you can't see it here, I don't think. No, you can't see it on the screen, but when you click on it, it, does, it highlights it on my screen. So all this stuff right here is highlighted on my screen. You just can't see it on the projector for some reason. So all that stuff is highlighted, and if I want to say um, I want to hide it, I can come over here, um, click in the style sheet, press enter to add a new style, and then said on this image that's up there, instead of uh, padding top, I'll say display colon none. I mean, I don't want to display that image. The only caveat that I know to 3D view is when you make your style sheet changes, it doesn't update there, so I have to come out of 3D view for it to be gone. But I just modified a style sheet here saying display none, now that logo is gone. So bringing all that into context, I'm, we're not going to go through everything on that, but I'm just going to show you what we do, at least this is what I do. I used to go modify the HTML and all that, and then upgrades would come along and it get very tedious. And then this also protects you for when upgrades come along, you still have your style sheet that people are not overriding that you can go um, do this with. So what I do is I come over here and uh, the, the uh, let's see, do I have that open? Right, I have it open over here in Notepad. So what I do is I create a style sheet, and I just call it this style sheet Bri Forum, and then I come over here to the source. This is the source of web interface, and like I said, you see, this is really hard to see too, this is um, all the source code for web interface as far as the HTML goes, and you see up here what I do is you find there's a tag that says head right here. All your style sheets go in the head tag. So you have some meta tags right here. And there's a style sheet here, and they're inclu including some more style sheets here. And so I just, what I normally do is go look for the closing head tag. So right here, there's the closing head tag, and I put a reference to my style sheet, my style sheet right here. So there's my bri form style sheet. So I put it, make sure it's last. And then I gotta make sure the styles within the style sheet are more specific than anything else. So Here's my style sheet. I'm just going to um, get rid of these comments so it actually takes effect. Save that. And so the way I did this, the way I found out you know, which things to target is using Firefox, the 3D view, and clicking. And it shows me where it is. So now if I go over here to refresh, refresh this, now my style sheet overrode what I don't want to show, and boom, only have a very clean login screen. I could put my own logo up there in the style sheet if you wanted to do that. So I have something very clean. I don't have to go try to hack up HTML. That using a style sheet works very nicely here. All right? Questions? Comment, question? Yeah, it, it, well, Well, I mean, this, uh, yeah, so. Style sheets the real hard way. Well, yeah, yeah, I learned style sheets the hard way. But, but, but it just show, shows me uh, the Firefox. Yeah, the, the Firefox thing makes all the difference in the world. All your browsers, IE, Chrome, Firefox, they all have an inspect to where you can see that, but the Firefox thing just blew me away the first time I saw it, and I was like, oh, because, like, what happens when you're inspecting, 
you have to click the elements and kind of keep going up the chain to figure out which one it is. With the Firefox thing, flipping on its edge and you click the thing in 3D view, and, oh man, I love it. Um, like I said, your graphics card has to support WebGL to do it, but that. And then, you know, this is very little style sheet. I mean, this is, that's all I did to change that page. Not very much at all. So the question is, is it possible to use CSS to insert a help desk link, for instance? Absolutely yes. So there is a style, we're actually going to, in a minute we're going to get to if you don't control the source, meaning if it's somewhere else, and you can't go modify a style sheet, I'll show you how to do that and insert content. And so there is, um, right here, you know, display colon none, there is a um, style sheet command called content. And so you can insert content before something or after something. You can change images, whatever you want to do. So yes, you can absolutely insert, um, insert uh, content without modifying the source. So just use style sheet. I use style sheet a lot to do this kind of stuff because it's very, very easy. Okay, questions? All right, so that makes life pretty easy. That's the CSS layers. Um, and so now we're going to get to, you know, everything that I've done so far is the caveat if you control the source. It, that was all hinging on me being able to go modify the HTML on the head statement and insert my style sheet there, right? What if it's not hosted by you? If you don't own the source, right? So maybe it's salesforce.com and you want to put a logo up there. Or maybe it's bribeforum.com and I want to do some cool stuff with bribeforum.com. I don't host bribeforum.com, but I do have something called a user style. So web browsers support something called user styles, which means I can put a style sheet in and my web browser will automatically insert that style sheet for me and then it'll insert it at the bottom so it has the, the layer order. So I have my kind of rules on what style sheet gets applied last, the user style does. You have to get into uh, your rules of specificity, but I taught you how to do that. So you can create user styles to apply to web pages even if you don't have the source. So let's see what that looks like. Um, let me see if I still have a uh, connection here. I might have to get off of this one. Okay, I'm gonna have to go on. I have a, a brought a wireless router with me so I could access my, my VMs. So I actually have to go to the internet now. So let's see. So, all right, so here's bribeforum.com, right? I don't control this, this is hosted somewhere else. I have no way of inserting my style sheet link and doing something crazy here, but by the power of user styles, which I've used over here on Safari. Let me quit Safari. I open up Safari, and I've inserted a user style for Safari. Now if I go to Bryforum from here, my user style is, should take over, and I have some glasses on Brian, and you just asked, inserting some text. Here is some important information from company XYZ, highlighted in red. So I've inserted text, I've changed a picture. I don't own this, this is not, I mean, I didn't go insert anything in the, the source for bribeform.com. I used a user style to do it. Now the cool thing about user styles is if in an enterprise environment, they're controlled, you can control it via GPO. So if I go over here to my domain controller that I have set up over here, <clears throat> All right, group policy management. Here's, you just go to you know, user settings, uh, control panel, internet, and then I just uh, say I want to create a new policy for this, and, I, and you can target different browsers. I just do IE10 for, for, um, for stuff here. The way that you do this in Internet Explorer is this accessibility button right here. Nobody ever clicks it but you should if you want to do this user style because if you click that, there's this, uh, the checkbox that says format documents using my style sheet. And then you just come over here and you check that and then you have a style sheet. That could be a file share in your environment so you have a centralized place for your style sheet. Put it there, apply it, 
and boom, everybody in your environment now has a user style sheet that you control. So it can be a user style sheet that controls something in your environment or outside your environment. So when the web page comes up, your style sheet will win. So there you go. You can do this in a lot of the major browsers. Um, it's different for everyone. So the way you do it in Safari is different than Internet Explorer. And of course, Internet Explorer has the nice um, you know, feature that a lot of people already have it because they have Windows and you can control it with uh, Active Directory. Okay? Questions? Got a question here. All right, so the question is, when you reference it in group policy, will it be applied to every web page? There's directives in CSS that you can say for this domain. So you could say, um, at the beginning, you say, brightform.com, open curly brace, here's all your styles for brightform.com. So anything but that ends in brightform.com. You could say anything that ends with google.com, that would, could be a different style. So you could have a style sheet that has multiple different uh, web pages that will, you know, say, based on the, the domain, this is what you get. So you can control that. You could even go to the specific page in the domain. So brightform.com slash quiz. And I could you know, go change all the quiz questions if I wanted to. So we're, we're just that specific page and everything else looked the same. So you can do that. So you have to reference it in the style sheet? Yes. You have to reference it in the style sheet. OK? Good question. All right. So that's it on styles. Um, OK. So I could have a few more minutes. Good. All right, the next thing I want to show you is um, AJAX and REST. So AJAX stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, and REST stands for uh, Representational State Transfer. And so, great, that's what it stands for. Let me tell you what they do. So this, these are really fancy names. So AJAX is JavaScript that you can put in your code that will go asynchronously do something and then come back so it won't hold up the, the web page. REST is a lot of people's APIs are REST, meaning it's just a URL. Um, so if I want to go interface with something that says, oh, we have a REST API, you hear that all the time, what does that actually mean? That means you can interface with somebody's system via a URL. That's all that means. You know, it's fancy words. It's not as complicated as it sounds. So what I want to show you right now is interfacing um, external data into a web page as well. So this is really helpful where I've done things like this is you have a, a login page or you have some kind of portal and you have a database over here that I want to show some stuff on here and I don't want to try to go and program database stuff and do a SQL query and all that because that's a lot of coding and it's not, 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 a, not very easy. So what we can do is if you have a REST endpoint, which a lot of people do, then you can put a very small amount of code, JavaScript code in your web page to go call a REST endpoint and show you that information. So let's see what that looks like. What I have here let's maximize all this stuff. All right. What I have here, we're going back to this machine, is do I have it up? Okay, so this is the, the REST endpoint first. So this is what, if, if you call a, a REST endpoint just from your web browser, it returns uh, most of the time XML. Um, you can do something called JavaScript object notation as well, which it'll, it'll be in XML also, but I just wrote a web service, uh, a REST, that had a REST endpoint that says, you know, there, here's uh, some status messages. So here's a status message. It has a date, it has a message that says something's jacked up, and it has a severity, which is error. And you can have multiple status messages here. So this is just one that I made up. And that's, that's what it looks like. Um, also, I have some HTML. I just went and downloaded a free uh, template that looks like this. So this is just a free template that I downloaded off the internet from uh, a website called Chaco Templates. Um, it's down here at the bottom. So Chaco templates, you know, they have some free templates. So if you're trying to design a website, here's what it looks like. So I just got a free template. Here it is. And say, imagine this is somebody's company portal. And over here, we have like, you have blog roll and you have contact. 
And down here, I want to insert some status messages, right, from that REST endpoint. So how can I integrate that? So this is what it looks like. So basically, all you do is I found in, you know, this is the source for what they, they give you. There's where it says um, the contact information, and then I created some HTML that just looked like, look like their HTML called system status. And I'm going to do an unordered list of system statuses, right? And then the way that you go call that REST endpoint is down here. This is the JavaScript to call that REST endpoint. So here you see a script tag up there, and then this is shortcut notation. This is called jQuery. It's just a JavaScript. It just makes it a little bit shortcut. So I'm saying whenever the document's ready, go do this AJAX call. Again, this is an asynchronous call. We're not waiting for the uh, whole page to load and you know waiting. So you know normally if this was not asynchronous, it'd have to wait for that web, uh, that uh, web service to return before we show the whole page. This is going to show the whole page. And then whenever this asynchronous call comes back, we'll add this information to it. So basically, um, you have a type, which is git, which on REST, you can have git, you can have post if you want to insert stuff, you can have update, you can have delete, all this kind of stuff. And then you give it the URL of where that REST endpoint is. That's the one that I just created for demo purposes. And I said, if you're successful, do this stuff, which basically I'm saying get the date, get the message, get the severity, and then add a list item to that on order list. And so that's, that's a fair, you know, pretty small amount of code to go call that REST endpoint. So this is what it looks like. If I go launch it, I'll let it run JavaScript. And then down here at the bottom, we have the system status. And so we're calling that REST endpoint. It says there is something jacked up. And then I'm showing the date and time. And then I'm not showing the severity as a word. I'm using it as a style. So severity error means you know color the text white and put a, back, a red background on it. That's coming from the style sheet. So based on the severity of the message, you put some different colors. You can put icons, whatever you want to do. So that is taking, you know, that, that was modifying very little. So here's a little place to hold the system's messages. Normally, you're not writing the rest endpoint. You're just saying you know, go to a REST endpoint. So that's how you interface with other systems. A lot of other systems have REST endpoints. All right? Questions on any of that? Interfa this is like taking a web page, interfacing with something else, or grabbing something else and bring it in, into your web page. Of course, you have to have, you have to be able to modify the source to do this. So it's not going to work for, um, you know, if, it, if you don't have the source. I didn't quite hear the question. So uh, the question is, uh, the user style sheet, if you have existing CSS. Right, the Citrix logo. Oh, could you replace the content with CSS to all of this? Like all of this HTML? Oh. Oh, just oh yes, oh just the status messages. Yes. So the the question is, um, if you, so technically you can do that. Um, you can kind of get around it. You'd have to do some some tricky things. So the, basically the question is, if you have um, using a user style and like the Citrix logon message, for example, bring this kind of stuff in with a REST endpoint. Yep. Right, so use that to use you know CSS to replace logon with system status right there. So have that integrated into that that page using the CSS. You technically could because you'd have to call that REST endpoint first to insert that information. That would get a little bit different. Um, they would kind of have to update the. You would have to have something that updates the user style sheet that inserts this content. So it would be some kind of periodic poll to the REST endpoint that goes and modifies that user style sheet that inserts that content, which is a little bit harder to do. Does that answer your question or I'm off base? That sounds like I'm still off base. Yeah, so maybe I don't, know, obviously I don't understand the question correctly.
Right. Right. So, yeah, if you have, if you want to control access to the source, like if you're saying the, the Citrix login page, like I inserted the style sheet there. You could use a user style sheet for that if you wanted to. And then if you wanted to put this JavaScript in the HTML for inside, like you, you saw me open up the HTML for. Yeah, if you, if you. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so the, I think I understand now. So you could add this, just this piece, to the Citrix login page. Right. And just that HTML that I showed you over here, uh, right here. So there's the, the JavaScript. You could put that on the login page for Citrix. You, um, you can include external JavaScript libraries. I mean, you don't have to type that in there, but. Yes, so you, you put a ju you just make this into a .js file. You include that in the head, and then that's, that part's done. That, I mean, yeah, that's not a problem to do that, yeah. But I, I, where I was getting confused is bringing in the user style sheet, trying to maybe, if you just wanted to use a user style without modifying any of the source at all. Right, yeah, so if you wanted to make this a JS file and put that in you know, the head section of your login page, yeah, that's not a problem, you can do that. And I just did it here um, because it was easy. Okay, good question. I, so, sorry about misunderstanding the question earlier, but I understand now, and yes, it's actually quite easy. All right, other questions? Okay. The last thing that I wanted to show you, we're about to wrap up here, is we did the, we did the Ajax and REST. The next cool thing that I like is something called jQuery UI. And what this is, is, is a, a collection of user interface elements that on, sit on top of jQuery. And of course, jQuery is just a JavaScript library. There's nothing magical about it. So jQuery UI is that's actually the name of the website. It has a bunch of cool stuff. Let's go to it. So jQueryUI.com, as long as I'm still connected, yeah. The, it has a bunch of things that you can add to web pages just using jQuery, so you don't have to go modifying a ton of source to do this. You have all these widgets, you know, like you know, I have a a, uh, a dialog box over here, so they give you an example. Here's a basic dialog. <clears throat> Here's a dialog with some some animation. So if I want to open the dialog, it does this cool little thing. Uh, a modal dialog, so you know you can't click on things in the background and you can move this around. All these kind of cool things that you can do with just jQuery and JavaScript. And so when you find something that you like, you can say, I want to download a, a jQuery library. And so it's kind of a wizard-driven thing where it says, all right, what do you want? You, ha you check all the boxes of things that you want. So I'm going to say, I'm, I'm not really um, concerned about, um, well, actually cancel that. I'm not really in concerned about all this, this draggable and resizable and all that, but in, I'm not concerned about all the widgets, but I really just want that dialog box. So I check that and it automatically checks all the dependencies for me. And then it creates a, uh, when you click download here, it creates an example HTML file that gives you all the information that you need to be able to put a dialog box in your, uh, in your code. And the way, what it looks like is this. Um, downloads jQuery. So I, I just downloaded, you know, I went through that exercise to download the dialog box, and this is what it gives you. By, out of the box, it gives you, you know, some, a style sheet that has some orange flavors here, and you could, when you do a download, you can pick out different kind of themes that they have available for you out of the box. <clears throat> and so this is what this one looks like, and they give you the example on how to do it. So you click this button that says open dialog, and it opens the dialog box. And all of this is being done with JavaScript, so it's cross-platform. So the final demo that I have to show is taking our trusty free template that we had earlier and adding in the jQuery stuff. So all I did was directly out of that, uh, that example HTML file that I downloaded, <coughs> put this, um, this button right here, you have 
A, which is anchor, meaning um, it's a, a text link <coughs> that usually opens a web page. If you put a hashtag, that means it's not going anywhere. It's just going to do nothing, but you can click on it. And then I'm saying uh, when you click on it, uh, which is in the JavaScript above, show it this dialog box right here. And so that was all included with the, the source from jQuery UI. And so you add that to your, um, your HTML. And so here we go again with all this stuff. And there's our, <coughs> I took the, the rest call out of here but then you have this little open dialog box and it has cool dialog box. You could use REST here as well. What, what I've used this for in the past is like just show a link to the, uh, like if your, your status message has a subject and it has a body to it and you don't want to show the whole body in here because it takes up too much space, you click that and it versus taking you to another web page, you pop it up in a dialog box. So you would click the link and it shows the, you the message um, to the to the body right there in a dialog box versus some link elsewhere. And so there's some cool things you can do with that. Um, and like I said, I use a lot of this stuff with, with Splunk because Splunk has a, a web interface and so I use a lot of this jQuery UI stuff. I use this dialog box, I use Hover. There's some cool things about showing um, information. So some cool things versus um, you know, when I want, you know, have, don't have a whole lot of screen real estate and I have a lot of stuff I want to show, I'll collapse things and say here's just a, a summary and here's a button, and when you press it, things drop down and show you more, and then you can press the button, and it comes back up. And that's all jQuery UI, and it's all free, and it's also open source, and it makes your, your user experience a lot better, and it's quite easy to, to implement in a web page as well. The, all the examples are out there. All right. Questions about jQuery UI. That was a real quick one. Free stuff, good stuff. With that, um, the, this is the, the final uh, slide I have is, these are links to things I use. So modifying binaries right here, um, this web page is actually the one that I use to learn how to insert code. When you're modifying uh, Windows applications and you say, I want to add a menu item and it actually do something, that, this guy right here, he's pretty hardcore and shows you how to do that. Um, the CSS specificity rules right here, all that, you know, doing the calculations. This guy explains uh, probably a lot better than I just explained on all this. So if you want to read on how all the, the CSS stuff works, then if you just want some really cool general CSS um, stuff, some tricks, so there's a CSSTricks.com. Um, that guy uh, is like the CSS master, and uh, there's a lot of cool things you can learn. So. You know, I used to modify web pages, like when I um, did web interface, I used to always go modify the HTML and all this, and it gets flaky and fragile. But um, over the years, I've learned just uh, most of what I can do is in CSS and get away with it that way. And, um, you know, it's a lot easier to maintain that way. So, that is the presentation. Any more questions? Yes, sir. So the question is, does any of the modifying binaries upset antivirus? Um, it can because when you start to modify binaries, you do, um, when you, well it depends on what you're doing. So when you, most of the time you ought, do update the CRC, so on it, so the uh, cyclic redundancy check. And some of your antivirus will see, oh, that executable change. But what, most of what I've seen, I've had no problems with the antivirus. Now, the, most of the stuff that I do, I'm taking stuff away versus adding stuff. This guy is like adding stuff to it. And so you do what's called um, finding what he calls is a code cave. So when you're creating a program, you have gaps in memory. So everything's memory space. And so with computers, you're pushing memory into registers. You're extracting it. So in a push and pop and move and all this kind of stuff, that's assembly language. When you compile, a lot of times there'll be gaps in the memory space. And so when you want to insert stuff, you can find a gap in the memory space and put your own code, which hackers do. So that's why you know, it's a very fair question about antivirus going through and checking that. So what we're doing here is we are inserting assembly line instructions into there to be able to, to uh, do what we want. Um, I haven't run into antivirus problems. That doesn't mean that I'm not the authority on that, though. So I would 
what I've seen personally, no. But knowing what I know on what this is doing, it's very possible. Good question. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so the question is, so the question is, I mean, uh, the question was about uh, the Splunk and modifying Splunk and kind of some of the things I do. This is not a Splunk session, so I mean, <laughs> yeah. The reason I know, the reason I've gone a lot of this and the reason I know jQuery UI is a lot of going through and making Splunk do things that it, is not out of the box functionality. And a lot of it's jQuery and a lot of it's CSS. So the reason I put this session in is twofold. Um, modifying the window stuff, not, a lot of people don't know that you can do. And I've done it a long time ago. I said like, that would be cool. But actually, the stuff that I do a lot on my job with Splunk is a lot of the web stuff. And I just like, well, I'm modifying web pages. I throw in modifying the window stuff as well. So um, yeah, I've, I don't have anything public on Modifying Splunk, so is that something you think would be interesting? Okay, so again, this is not a Splunk session. I don't want to talk about Splunk. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you, you, you think that would be useful to the community? Okay, I can do. I certainly can do that. Yeah, absolutely. I will actually. All right, but I don't want it to be a, a sponsored session here if it's not sponsored by Splunk. All right. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>